and welcome to this week's edition of Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're glad you joined us. Our guest on today's program, well, he is one of the icons of public radio. He's been the voice delivering some of the most enduring news stories of our time, from the hostages in Iran to 9-11, a broadcasting career that has spanned half a century. He's that guy, the one that oozes confidence in his vocal tones. And when you hear him deliver the news, you just know that everything's going to be okay because he told us so. But more importantly than that, you can trust what he's saying. He's the kind of broadcaster that I say, they just don't make them like that anymore. He's the real deal, the whole package, and we are thrilled, absolutely thrilled to have in our studios Carl Castle. His unbiased delivery lets the story speak for itself. He has been the morning an anchor at Morning Edition for National Public Radio and now co-host of NPR's popular quiz show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, a roving ambassador for NPR, Carl Castle. Good to Thank be you. here, Barbara. Thank you very much for having me. We're so excited to have yeah, you here. Yeah. And you are here as part of WKU Public Radio's 30th anniversary. Exactly. And I'm happy to be around here to help uh, cut the cake, so to speak, Absolutely. and sing happy birthday and wish you guys a lot of luck uh, in the future, too. Note yes, he it's, it's, said, it's, it's, sing happy birthday. Hmm, think we can uh -huh. get him to do that. You now, we want to know. talk about you because, sure. as I say, you, you are, when you heard me say that word icon mm -hmm. of public broadcasting, what goes through your mind when you hear yourself referred to as an icon? I look around, who? You're talking, talking <laughs> to me? They're talking about what? me? <laughs> they are talking about yeah. you. My wife throws the word around quite a bit. I'm sure she won't Te let you. Teasing know. me, of course. Of course. Yeah. You know, and I also said in yeah. the introduction that you were able to and have delivered some of the most enduring yes. news stories of our time. You mentioned the fact that you started with National Public Radio in the mid-70s. I was, it was 1977 when I joined the company, and I was there when Morning Edition went on the air in 1979. It went on the air November 5th of that year, on a Monday morning. But the weekend previous to that, a big, big story was breaking, and it was our first big story for the program itself. Went on for 444 days, if I remember. That's when the uh, these group of guys took over the American uh, uh, embassy yes. in uh, Tehran and took our guys hostage. And so you followed that story we as it unfolded. We followed that story. And you know what? When, the sh when it all ended, 40, 444 days later, that a lot of those people who were held hostage came to NPR to check out the uh, coverage in our tape library to hear what we were doing and they went home and wrote books about what they learned from our coverage. From your coverage. They thought it was the best. It is the best. Mm -hmm. And you know we talk about trustworthy uh, national public mm -hmm. radio and of course PBS. They are considered some of the most trusted sources for sure. news. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about you, because you're the guy, you're kind of like me. I used to practice my Academy Awards speech in front of the mirror and then decided that maybe I'd go into broadcasting instead. But <laughs> you were that guy, too, who used to stand behind the radio and pretend? I would. Yeah, I would. This is before I even began going to school. I do remember it vaguely. I'd hide behind the radio in the corner, and somebody would pass by, and I would be say, this is WGBR, Goldsboro, North Carolina, or not, my hometown, of course. But later on, what I would do, before the first grade, my grandmother had a wind-up Victrola, and I would get her two or three records she had, and I would play a record, and when it was over, I would make up a commercial and do that, then put a record on and play it again, and when that finished, I'd make up some news and do that, and then put another record on. I'd do that for hours until my mother would run me out of the house, go out and play, get some sunshine. <laughs> and so what our audience is thinking, yes, those people are addicted, those people that, I say it's a sickness, indeed That's it is. That's what I wanted to do from the very beginning. <laughs> but who were, did you have some mentors, or you know, were you listening no, to radio I at listened the time? to the radio all the time. All the time. I love those programs, The Lone Ranger, Superman, uh, the House of Mystery. I'd sit up at night listening to programs like The Inner Sanctum, The Hermit's Cave, or uh, any program that was on. I would listen to it. This is Your Life with Ralph Edwards, or Truth or Consequences. I wanted to do some of those quiz programs, and today I'm doing one of those quiz <laughs> Be programs. Be careful what you ask <laughs> yeah. for. Uh -huh. So this was in North Carolina. Yes, you were uh, getting this, this uh, fix, if sure, you will, yeah. and practicing behind the scenes knowing that nothing was going to stop you. Huh? And my dad would take me out to the radio station on the, on the outskirts of town from time to time on a Sunday afternoon, go in there and see those guys behind the plate glass windows doing their work. 
But what fascinated me a lot was going to that little room right off the lobby where there was a teletype machine typing away the news. That was fascinating. I couldn't read it. I couldn't read by then. I was, that young? Oh, that young. But it was fascinating to watch it. I wanted to be a part of that one day. Isn't that something? So then you go on to school and mm -hmm. you're in North Carolina. Right. You went to UNC, mm -hmm. Chapel Hill. Right. And you studied drama as well. I did. In high school now, we had one of the best high school drama departments in the state of North Carolina. And the guy who uh, developed it had some uh, great ideas on how to do drama. And I uh, was in almost every play that came along. But we had one class in radio. And the kids before me, they took the money from their plays and built a radio studio up in the old projection booth in the auditorium with a connection to the local radio station. And we would do radio plays up there. And he would challenge us when, now this is gonna be a fire. How are we gonna have fire? Get some uh, cellophane paper, crackle it, crackle it. And one time we did a play where, uh, on the radio where these people were in a lifeboat and on the floor in the studio was a big wash tub full of water. And so somebody would sit there and just splash the water back and forth from time to time, like the water lapping up the side of the boat. So there was a, a big learning experience. And also, we had, a, as I said, a direct line to the local radio station. And they gave us each week 15 minutes of high school news time. And I got to read that from time to time. And that summer, I was 16 they offered me a part-time job. Oh, you know, and, and as you're talking about this, what people don't realize is, you know, when we say you are an icon of public yeah, yeah. radio, Carl Castle, there you are, but your training ground mm -hmm. made you have to think, if you will, yeah. because um, wax philosophical with me about what we're seeing coming through the gates these days, mm -hmm. and, and then you really did have to use your imagination. You know, how can you make the sound of fire? Sure. Use mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. paper. And you had to use your voice to tell the story. One story we did on the air, I remember we had a radio script, The Telltale Heart, Edgar Allan Poe, where the guy kept hearing his heart beat all the time. Where do you get the sound of a heart? You get a handkerchief and you go boom, 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 ah. boom, boom, in front of the microphone. There so we had to use our imagination. And you know, uh, not so long ago, a few weeks ago, a fellow, I think in Detroit, died who used to produce these programs on, on network radio shows. And he said that he could create with sound an image in your mind that would be more frightening than anything television could do. Like a squeaking door with a howling wolf in the background, you know, things like that. Just through sound. It's, it's the, it's the uh, theater of the imagination that takes over. Which can and be a whole and, lot and scarier. And Alistair Cook, years ago, said he'd talked to a little girl about radio and TV, and he said she liked radio better because the pictures were better. Oh. Uh -huh. Doesn't that say it all? Liked radio better uh -huh. because the pictures were better. Yeah. So there you go. You're, you're studying drama. You get this break at age 16. You're yeah. working at the radio station. And were you just born with those vocal cords, or uh, did you have to develop Well, them? I guess my voice was changing about that time. Uh, 16 years old and uh, I was very became very conscious of how I sounded the words my accent because I'm from the south you know we North have, Carolina North Carolina and uh, we, we do have a thick southern accent down there from time to time as a matter of fact all the time <laughs> and uh, I wanted to get rid of that I read books on the subject I talked to people on the subject I learned from a lot of good people that I worked with to help me along and when I went to college after high school, then uh, I, I applied that and I got a job at the local commercial station to help pay my bills. And about that time, the first, uh, one of the first, uh, they call them educational radio stations by then, not public radio, not educational public. stations. Uh -huh. uh, the, uh, the university went on the air, WUNC, and it's on the air still today. And I was on the original staff. We're on the air four hours at night and we just had fun. We didn't have any 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 rules on how you did things. No we preconceived just, we, notions. We, we just made it up as right? we went along. We experimented and had fun. Made it up as you go. And along with you uh -huh. there, uh, turned out was uh, somebody that people might know, a name. Well, let's back up to high school. Uh, another person that a lot of people know, who was a high school teacher while I was there. I worked with him from time to time, but he, uh, he taught uh, some drama 
uh, but he, he, he uh, conducted the, uh, the chorus. Good musician, Andy Griffith. Andy Griffith of Andy Griffith, Griffith. fame. Yep, he was, was there. Teaching. And he wanted you to go into drama. He, he did. encouraged you. He did. I, I, the last play I was in was The Father of the Bride, and I was the father. And he came to me after the final performance and said, you should go into theater. I thanked him, and I said, I'm going to stay in radio because I love it so much. But you know, radio is a kind of theater, isn't Sure, it? it is theater of the mind. It is theater of yeah, the mind. Yeah. And, and just using that voice, and like I say, you were blessed with some vocal cords that yeah. certainly enhanced. Sure. But you know, so there you are, you're okay. in college, UNC, you were one of the original members, and someone else. Yeah, a guy named Charles Corralt was also a student. We were both 18 at the time. <laughs> and we did a lot of work together. Well, when I went to school, I, uh, do I want to take radio in, in the radio TV department? Nah, I've been in the business for two years. I know all I want to know. I need to know. They can't teach me anything new. Right. But I spent more time there than I did in class and studying with the radio TV department and did a lot of work with them, as did Charles. And so we did a lot of work together. As what I, as degree I did you get from UNC? Uh, in, uh, in English. You got a degree in English. Charlie, he studied, uh, majored in history. He wanted to be a print journalist. I'll be darned. And he did. He went back to Charlotte, his hometown, where he was living, and uh, went to work for a, a newspaper. But of course, things happen. He got pushed this way and that way and wound up on the road. CBS on the road with Charles yeah. Kuralt. Yeah. Did you keep in touch throughout the years? Uh, from time to time we ran across each other. Uh, but one story I, I heard about Charles, and I think you might enjoy this one. He was on the road with his producers, and they were going from town to town looking for stories. And they ran through this small town, I don't know where it was, but they had banners up, welcome home Joe Smith, welcome home Joe Smith. They wondered, who is Joe Smith? They got the cameras out and the mics, and they went around town talking to townspeople find find out who Joe Smith was. Well, he was a, a veteran coming home from the war, and they were giving him a big welcoming. And they talked to school teachers, they talked to the police, they talked to everybody who knew Joe Smith. And after a while, Charles said, okay, we're done now, we can leave. His producer said, don't you want to hang around and meet Joe Smith? Charles said, I've already met him. Wow. And left and left just like that. The people told him all he wanted to know about Joe Smith. That's all he needed to know yeah, to tell yeah. the story. And you know, you could tell any story and people would love to listen. And uh, how would you like to have Carl Castle do the voice on your answering machine? Well, that's one of the prizes. <laughs> wait, wait, don't tell me. We're going to find out more about that and find out more about the fabulous career of uh, radio icon Carl Castle when Outlook continues. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be back after this. Stay with us. From Charlie and Lucy's answering machine in Manasquan, I'm Carl Castle. Some of you may not recognize my voice, and you're wondering, why is this man in Charlie and Lucy's answering machine? But don't let that confuse you. The process is the same. When you hear the beep, leave a message. And no, I'm not going to tell you why I'm here. You'll have to ask Charlie and Lucy about that. Outlook continues. I'm Barbara Deeb, and we are joined in the studio by that voice, that man, Carl Castle. And you may know him, and just, just close your eyes and listen to him, and certainly you know him if you listen to National Public Radio, and one of its more popular shows, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. But before we go to all that, you know, you started telling us about your career, you get to college, you know, you, you realized your dream, you were working in radio, then you went to NPR, kind of started on the weekend, didn't you, for the uh, way, All Things I, I did. As a matter of fact, I was, uh, we moved to the D.C. area back in 1965, and I wound up in an all-news station in Arlington. Before then, I was a DJ. 
played records, wanted to be an entertainer, you know, that, that sort uh -huh. of thing. But I wound up uh, at an all news station and wound up as a news director. And here's a story for you. One day, one summer, 1982, I get a note from the owner. Carl, we have a family friend who has a daughter who's studying journalism at the University of Virginia and she's looking for an internship this summer. Here's her name and address if you're interested. So I call up Katie Couric. <laughs> <laughs> and we chuckle, huh? And Katie came in and helped us out during the summer and came back uh, for the election in November and helped us out then. And so uh, another dear friend that uh, kind of crossed my path right then. It, they, you know, it is amazing in this business. You know, in the break, we were talking about the fact that, you know, it is a bit of an addiction mm. when you work in, yes. the, in this oh, yes, field because if you love it as much as you do, it's never a day's work, is no, it? No, no. You may get tired. You may go home weary because you had a long day. I, I remember 9-11. What a busy, busy, busy morning we had putting things together. Sure. So they made sense, for one thing. But when I left... Uh, boy, I'm glad to get home now and listen to the radio and find out what's going on. But I felt good. I left with a good feeling. We'd done a good job. We did a good job that morning. Sated. All, all of us together, working together, did a good job. Because it is that. It, it is. takes uh -huh. so many people working together. While you might be the one whose voice is out there delivering right. that story. There are many people behind me. That's right. Doing a lot of work. Yes. Who put that story together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about how things have changed. You know, we were laughing uh, and gosh, we're hmm. telling our age. But you, you know, I mean, I remember using a razor blade to edit. Oh, sure. Tape. Sure. But you even remember before that. Going back, uh, remember when uh, reports from overseas were filed by shortwave radio. Today they're emailed in and they sound like the reporters right there in the room with you. I played 78 RPM records back in the old days. Today, they don't exist. Everything's in the computer, the music. So many things have happened. Back in my days, when the, uh, a network would send a program out to the, to the stations, done by telephone line. Today, it's done by satellite. And by the way, NPR became the first network to deliver programs by satellite, first radio network. And uh, it's been that way ever since for everybody. So things have changed so much. I used to use a manual typewriter Today, it's what we used to call a glorified typewriter, a computer. A computer. Yeah. But for the better? For the better, of course. We can do our work faster and get, and get more done and bring in more th things to use electronically. And, and the sound is enhanced. The sound is better. You can understand people now. There you yeah. go. But what, what about the audience? Is it a more sophisticated audience? I think, I think they are. They expect it now. They do. They, uh, they tune in, they expect to hear high quality stuff. And we have prided ourselves over the years in being able to deliver high quality sound uh, to our audience. Well, now they talk about something these days called new media and how a lot of what we refer to as radio is going mm -hmm. to the web. You know, a lot of people mm -hmm. consume their news via the web. And that is not necessarily as sophisticated, I would think, in, in the sound. So what do you make of that? Well, I'm, I'm not involved with that. I know that uh, NPR is getting very heavily involved in uh, the, the media mm -hmm. uh, concept. Uh, we don't call ourselves radio anymore. We just say, this is NPR, and that's it. And you'll find that the case around the country. Radio stations have dropped the word radio. They may use the word this is Chicago Public Media, which they do now, or just the call letters, but not the word radio, because we're more than just radio. We're on the web. We, we tweet. We, <laughs> do all sorts, we blog. We do all these things. <laughs> but could you ever imagine? And you know, I see the twinkle in this man's <laughs> eyes. I don't know if it comes across, but you love what you do, and, and these changes don't bother you in the least. Not a bit. They're exciting. We're moving they? along. It's exciting yes. to see something that we can, we can, we can expand and deliver our product in many different ways. Now, for, for example, wait, wait, don't tell me. Three million listeners on the radio, one million podcasts. Wow. See? That's amazing. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. You okay. retired from NPR, National Public Radio, Morning Edition as their anchor. I mean, wow. That had to be a tough decision uh, because you certainly didn't have to go, but you decided you wanted to go? Yeah. The time had come, and I had an opportunity to do something new, so I took it. 
and I get to be able to sleep late in the morning. Rather than get up at one o'clock in the morning, I now get up at six. Oh. That, now that's one big change. No, really, he had to get up at 1.05 a.m. every morning to bring us the news on National Public Radio. And you know why I got up at 1.05 why? and not 1 o'clock? Why? Because I told an audience one time I like to sleep in. <laughs> it, it fooled you into thinking you were sleeping in? Is that what it was? No, I, no. This, it's a joke I told at uh, a conference in Boston uh, several, before Wait, Wait went on the air. Okay. And I introduced some NPR people and then people began asking me questions about, you get up early? Uh-huh. What time do you get up? And I said, five after one. And I, I was joking. And this one at one o'clock, and I said, because I like to sleep in. It was a big joke. They laughed, got a big laugh. Doug Berman, who going to produce Wait, Wait. He was uh -huh. there. He thought it was funny. And they talked to me the next day about being on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Let's, for our audience who may not be familiar with Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, but it is a quiz show. And you made a reference to how you wanted to be a part of a quiz show and be careful what you ask for because you got it. And I got it. And so it's based out of Chicago, WBEZ yes. mm -hmm. in Chicago. And it's a weekly quiz show mm -hmm. on the radio. We take the news and uh, take a, a funny look at what happened during the week. And as long as we have politicians and dumb criminals, we will always have material. <laughs> we have a, but why we, do you think people find that so, so uh, wonderful? Um, because, you know, you wouldn't think that a quiz show on radio would do well, and yet it does. As it you does. say, three million listeners on the radio, one million on mm -hmm, sure. the Internet. So what do you think it is? It's, uh, well, it's funny to begin with. It's very funny. People tell me that they can sit in the driveway on Saturday morning when they hear it, or Sunday morning, and they cannot get out of their car until the program is over. And that's very telling. Yeah. During the break, we recorded or we played for our audience one of your recordings that if you win the quiz show, if you get all the answers right in many cases, your prize will be Carl Castle doing your voice machine. And we do that because at the beginning of the program, we didn't have any money to buy tote bags or coffee <laughs> mugs to, to mail out to the winners. I was asked to do this for a short time, and that was about 3,000 messages ago. 3,000 people out there have yeah. Carl Castle on their voice machine. <laughs> so if you call one of them, you'll know that, that this is where it came from. So, you know, you've covered so many stories. You've reported so many stories. Do you have a special moment that in your career just meant so much to you? It's kind of hard. I, I can think of many moments which I thoroughly have enjoyed uh, doing. Not that the story itself was that, that good, like 9-11. Sure. I, I thought we did a good job that morning keeping up with what was, was going on. Uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall I thought was very significant in, in, in our history and its ramifications since then. But being on this quiz program has been a, just a delight for me. And the, 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 the opportunity I have of making up some voices, you know, because there's a... Using your drama. We have a, we have a, a segment called Who's Carl This Time? And I can talk like uh, Monica Lewinsky <laughs> or any Britney Spears or any, anybody like that, you know, uh -huh. and just have fun with it. And, it's, it's, and people love it. They like it. Absolutely. And we have, well, we have people on there that you would never think would ever be on a quiz program like this. And we ask Supreme Court Justice Charles Breyer, why, Stephen Breyer, why he would be on a program like this, that you're a, a respected jurist, the first Supreme Court Justice to appear uh, on any kind of quiz program, radio or TV. He says, well, because my uh, sister-in-law wanted me to do it and I <laughs> wanted to keep peace in the family. <laughs> I love it. We're just about out of time. I, I can't believe it because uh, you've been such a delight and this half hour has gone by so quickly. But you know, people, when they refer to you, you are trusted, you are unbiased. But how would you want people when they say Carl Castle's name, what do you want them to say? That he had a good time. That he had a good time doing what he was doing and enjoyed it. And what else can I say? That uh, he never retired because there was nothing to retire from. People retire from work and I never worked a day in my life. And I learned that from Dickie Smothers of the Smothers Brothers. And we will leave it at that. It has been a true delight. Continued success as you continue doing what you love.
Well, thanks for having me here, Barbara. Thank you for Appreciate being it. here. We've been talking with the man uh, known as Carl Castle, the man who is one of the co-hosts of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, the popular NPR quiz program, and in addition for years anchored the news on Morning Edition, brought us those stories, the stories of our time. That's going to wrap it up for this week's edition of Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb. I'm so glad you joined us, and I'm so thankful to have had Carl Castle in the studio. We'll see you next time.